I know the trial hasn't come up yet. And that's a big part of why I wanted you on this show. Because your son has been languishing. And I don't use that word uh, lightly. He's languishing in an African prison for going on 11 years with no trial, no trial. So is, before we get to why it's taking so long, is there anything that you can tell us about the incident itself? If, it, if you can't, because I understand that this is, you weren't there, number one. And number two, he has a trial that's coming up. But is there any, you, you mentioned he has a co-defendant. Um, how did that person come into play? Did they go down there together? How much can you actually tell us about the case? It's, 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 it, we're going to start from the beginning. They both met each other. They met each other on Rikers Island. Remember I told you my son had a gun charge? Yes. So this guy comes in from L.A. Of course, you know Rikers Island. He's coming from another place. He can't use the phone. He can't do this, that, other. My son makes sure he can use the phone. And I try to tell people, I say, sometimes you, you, a bond comes in jail way faster than a bond does in the streets. If a person looks out for you, if a person does little things, you might end up talking to that person every day, whereas in the streets, you might never talk to them again. So they got cool with each other. So this guy was going to Africa also. So come to find out that that's the reason my son went to Africa. You know what I'm saying? So he said, okay, I'm going to hang out. Now, I don't know what his intentions were. I know what my son's intentions were. And my son's intentions are still speaking to this day too, because it's a young lady that he met inside the mall when he was there. And she's been with him the whole 10 and a half years. This is fiance now. Her mother and father go see him. They sit down and, and um, read the Bible together. They do everything. And my son say, dad, I told you, I wasn't running around here looking for nobody. I was running around here trying to talk to these girls because this is something foreign to me. And she said, yeah, I met him in the mall. And then I talked to I talked to two people inside the clubs and said, oh yeah, you look, I say, I look like the guy that was here last week, right? And they say, yeah, I said, that's my son. So my son was out there enjoying himself. So when I asked my son, what do you know about this case? Because that was my first question when I got there. What do you know about this case? He said, dad, I don't really know nothing. He said, they said it's a white guy. They said his name is Andre Heckemeyer. He said they didn't say nothing else. He said they came to the hotel room. I was in there smoking weed. He said they locked me up. They locked him up, which is a co-defendant. He said, all I know is we got charged with weed. Next thing they say, they're going to charge us with murder. Now, the trial has started. But in the middle of the trial, my son got rid of five lawyers. All right? He got rid of five lawyers. After I got finished paying the lawyers, Okay, I went through my own personal stuff down in Namibia, you know, financially, some people ran off and this, that, and the other. I almost got kidnapped down there, whole bunch of other things. So my son ended up using the financial aid lawyer. So by him using the financial aid lawyer, all of them wanted him to come in and plead guilty. All of them wanted him to say this, that, and the other. And my son was like, no, I'm not going to do that. So after I met some good people over there that told me I was going to be really safe over there, I started to go back over there to see my son. And I got in contact with a good lawyer, a great lawyer, actually, who believes in God, who believes in family, who doesn't believe in where you're from, what color you is, and he's going hard for my son. And that's when I said, you know what? I can't do this by myself. And that's when, you know, I put pride and everything to the side. You know, and, and one of the main things that I heard about that is you do go to the people that you depend on first. So in order for me to get to that level, in order for me to get to that level where I had to cry out to the world, that means I absorbed all the, all, I absorbed everything. And the thing that hurt the most about that situation, and this is where I say people can get caught up in pride, is... I got phone calls around me, yo, what's up with Bonds? He crying on Instagram. 
Is he okay? Is he having a nervous breakdown? And a close friend of mine, Uncle Paulie, he said, nah, he's not having a nervous breakdown. He's crying out for his son. And he's just hoping somebody listens. And that's when I realized that pride and everything else has no, no, no room inside anybody. If it has a room inside you, it's going to take up too much room and it's going to cause you to miss a lot of things in life, a lot of doors that can be open to you in life if you just deal with that pride. You know what I'm saying? So when I came back from Africa and my son actually told me that this is the part that I played in it, I didn't know nothing about it. He said, why would I, I don't know this guy. He said, I don't know him. He said, I don't know no white people in Africa. He said, I don't know. He said, I came down here and I was in the malls and I was having a good time. And I said, yo, and, and I cried, man. That was when I first cried because I really couldn't imagine being in Africa regardless of what I've been through. I've been a phone call away from my mother, my brothers, my sisters, my family, my friends. If they hear you, Sounding not too good, you get an unexpected visit on Saturday. Oh, you just didn't sound good on the phone. I can't do that with him. If he, I don't get to talk to him on the phone. You know what I'm saying? I don't get to write him. I don't get to text him. So if his girlfriend tells me, oh, I went to see him today, Pop, but he didn't sound too good, I don't know what's going on. He'd have been sad. He'd have been fought. I went to American Embassy. The embassy told me my son did 90 days in solitary confinement. I said, my son did 19 months of solitary confinement. They said, no, he's lying to you, Mr. Rome. I said, you didn't look me in the eye and tell me my son looked me in the eye and lied to me? And this is how much they think of us as fathers. He looked me in the eye and said, yes, your son is lying. When I went back over there, the lawyer said, no, I'm the one that got him out of solitary confinement. He was in solitary confinement for 19 months, 24 hours a day. So imagine me as a father not being able to make sure my son is okay. One, him being locked up for something that he clearly now did not do. And now that everything is coming out, I had so many people coming at me from Africa. You know, I had so many people that's, that, that now after 11 years, some of the same, not saying all of them, some of the same people say, yo, something really wrong with this case. There's something really going on. I've got people that write me and say, I drive by that jail every day and think about your son. Why haven't they did this? Why haven't they done that? They lied and said they had a gun in the case. It wasn't until we started the beginning of the trial that we see that they didn't have no gun in the case. We find out they didn't have no DNA. If you sweat or do anything, shit, if you touch anything nowadays, it's DNA. There's no DNA. There's no eyewitnesses. And it's like, okay, what are you holding this young man on? They've hidden evidence. They they said that they had a, a, a silencer and a barrel, right? Which they didn't find the first time that they searched the room when they found these kids in the room smoking marijuana. They found no weapons, no nothing. A week later, they came up and said, okay, we found a barrel and a silencer there. Their own ballistics, man, got on trial and said, the silencer and the battery that I looked at never been used, never been fired, never been anything. So even if you did, let's say hypothetically, you did find it in there, this is not nothing that was fired to kill nobody or nothing that was used to kill nobody. And that's their ballistics, man. But it takes all this time for these things to come out. You know what I'm saying? They got a passport person. I said, why can't you why can't you try these two individuals separate? They said, because they came to Namibia together, which means they have to be tried together. Once again, their witness got on the stand, a Sweden passport officer, and said, no, one of these passports are stamped Sweden. So he came to Sweden to get to Namibia. My son's passport never was stamped in Sweden. So that shows you that they didn't travel there together. So if they didn't travel there together, why can't they be tried separately? You understand? So there's so many different things that they're making up these laws as they go along. You know what I'm saying? They have another, they have a, three guys on there that said that they the one that sold my son and the guy the gun. 
okay, where did you get the gun from? It's been 11 years now, and they say the person that they got the gun from, they just happened to see that one day, but they never bumped into that person again in 11 years. So they don't know where that person is they got the gun from what kind of gun it was that they sold. They couldn't identify. And second of all, they never ever got locked up. So the lawyer was like, okay, y'all the only ones that submitting to having a gun. Y'all never got locked up? He said, has your, have any of your houses or lofts been searched? They said, no. So the lawyer said, the gun could be in one of your houses. If y'all the only ones, if, 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 if my defendant is saying he never had a gun, Y'all saying y'all had a gun and brought a gun from somebody that y'all can't find, then why wasn't y'all ever charged with at least having a gun? I've never seen that. Even if you cooperate with them, you're going to get charged first, and then you have to work for them by cooperating to get that charge done away. But these three individuals who already had open cases, who some of them have open cases now, never ever got charged in a case. So the only one that's charged in this case is my son and his co-defendant. Where is that? Why is that? And this is what America is not asking. Everyone that I've went to, every celebrity, every shies away from this case, and I'm trying to wonder why. When this is a black son, this is a black father, this is a black country, you know what I'm saying, of an American first time ever being charged with murder in this country, that's big news. If you come to aid, if you come to help, if you televise, all of this is big views. This is big. I'm trying to wonder why. Where is, where is the prayer? Why doesn't America say we just want to at least watch this trial? All we ask is this man is not getting on here asking people to say his son is innocent. He's not asking people to say his son is guilty. You know what I'm saying? Because he wants justice for the family and he wants justice for the victim, but not by the head of his son. And that's why I'm saying I'm just asking for justice, period. Why is America scared to stamp their name on asking for justice? What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.